Hey, you guys. So, you know how I recently put out a video where I checked out one of the Z490 boards built for Intel's new 10th gen chips? You know, ASUS's tough gaming Z490 Plus Wi-Fi? Well, in that video, I may have said that Intel's new chips don't seem all that new or exciting to me, but that was before I actually got my hands on one. And now that I do, I'll be the first to admit that I was wrong because I'm pretty friggin' hyped right about now. And that's because the chip I have right here in the Tough Gaming Z490 is Intel's brand new Core i7-10700KF. And this thing is a friggin' monster. Now, don't get me wrong, the new Intel chips still don't feel new, and that's because they aren't. They're built on the same old Skylake 14 nanometer architecture, and the only thing new about them are the refinements, optimizations, and tweaks Intel made to the architecture. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing to get excited about here. And as we'll see when we get to the benchmark numbers, excitement is definitely warranted, especially if you're a gamer. Now before we actually get to those numbers, we have to take a quick look at some other numbers. Or more specifically, let's get a quick refresh of what Intel's Comet Lake actually brings to the table. At the high end, we have the i9-10900 and the i7-10700. That's right, Intel is actually keeping things somewhat uncomplicated for this generation, only releasing one base model of each of those chips. And I say somewhat uncomplicated there because there are actually five versions of each of those chips. Chips with a K at the end are overclockable. Chips with an F don't have integrated graphics and cost less. Chips with a T at the end are low power models. And the base models with no letters ship with an iGPU aren't low power and aren't overclockable. So yeah, not actually all that streamlined, but there was an attempt. Now, the Core i9s all feature 10 cores and 20 threads and vary in TDP from 35 watts all the way up to 125 watts with the two most expensive chips at the top featuring max single and all core frequencies of 5.3 and 4.9 gigahertz respectively. Those high frequencies are made possible thanks to Intel's new thermal velocity boost, which claims to be able to boost those chips to those clock speeds as long as certain conditions like a set temperature are met. This new feature is exclusive to the Core i9 lineup, leaving the rest of the product stack to make do with Turbo Boost 2.0 and Turbo Boost Max 3.0, which includes the Core i7 chips, all of which ship with eight cores and 16 threads, have the same TDP range as the i9s, and the two chips at the top of the stack max out at a single core boost of 5.1 gigahertz and an all core boost of 4.7 gigahertz. The Core i5 and Core i3 are a little more complicated than the higher end chips, and I'm pretty eager to get to the i7 we're actually reviewing here, so I won't be digging too deeply into those. But the most important thing to keep in mind here is that the i5s now all ship with 6 cores and 12 threads, and all the i3s have 4 cores and 8 threads. Now, onto our little processor right here, the 10700 KF. As we know, this particular CPU ships without an iGPU and can be overclocked. We also know that it has 8 cores and 16 threads and that it can boost all the way up to 5.1 GHz on a single core. This thing is basically last gen's 9900K, only with higher boost clocks support for 2933 MHz RAM and is expected to cost around $100 less. That's insane! Unfortunately, I don't actually have confirmed retail pricing for the chip just yet, but it's expected to cost a little more than what Intel's charging its direct customers, which is $350. With these specs and that price, these new Core i7s have the potential to make the CPU war legitimately interesting again, but only if they have the performance to back up the specs. So without further adieu, let's get into the benchmark, shall we? The test bench I'll be using looks a little something like this. We've got 16 gigabytes of RAM running at 2933 megahertz, and we have a 750 watt PSU from Antec keeping the chip fed. Then even though I know it's not exactly ideal for CPU benchmarking, my GTX 1080 is the highest end GPU I have on hand right now. So if your GPU is better than mine, then your numbers will be better than mine. Everything I just listed is plugged into Asus's Tough Gaming Z490 Plus Wi-Fi. Aboard that, as I noted in my overview video, which you should definitely check out over here, seems more than capable of pushing our 10700 KF to its limits. Now, let's get things started. And right off the bat, we're gonna put the chip through its paces with some heavy synthetic benchmarks. Cinebench R20 is up first. And as soon as the benchmark started, I knew this was going to be an interesting one. The 10700 KF managed an impressive score of 490 in the single core test, and an even more impressive score of 4664 in the multi-threaded test. Next up is Blender and its useful new benchmarking tool. For this benchmark, I chose to render 
rendered the BMW, Fishy Cat, and Pavilion scenes. The BMW render took 2 minutes and 51 seconds, the Fishy Cat render took 4 minutes and 37 seconds, and the Pavilion scene took 9 minutes and 41 seconds to render. Testing compression and decompression was left up to 7-zip's included benchmark, in which the chip managed a compression rate of 54,216 MIPS, and decompression of 77,910 MIPS. As great as all those numbers are, let's get real here. Most of us are eyeing these chips for gaming. So let's just get to it. All of the gaming benchmarks were run at 1080p using high settings to try to single out CPU performance as much as possible. First up is Unigen's fairly intense superposition benchmark, and hot dang do I love the numbers I see. The 10700KF managed an average FPS of 83 with rock solid 1% and 0.1% lows, along with an overall score of 11101. Which, if you reverse those numbers, was actually the number for the police here in South Africa a long time ago. I'm not sure if it still is, but that's kind of weird. Anywho, Civ 6 is up next, and rather than messing around with frame rate, the average turn time is what's most important here, with lower being better, obviously. And low it was, with the CPU averaging only 30.4 seconds per turn. Our first AAA title comes in the form of Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which ran an average of 91 FPS and showed decent 1% and 0.1% lows. Doom Eternal rips and tears its way into the limelight next, and ran at an average FPS of 182, with 1% and 0.1% lows never dipping below 100 FPS. Next up is Monster Hunter World, which ran hella smooth, at an average of 107 FPS, with a 1% and 0.1% low, of 85 and 57 FPS, respectively. Overwatch drops in as our first esports title, and it drops in hot with an average FPS of 275, with just crazy high 1% and 0.1% lows. One thing to note here is that the game is capped at 300 FPS, which the system was actually hitting fairly regularly, so average FPS might probably be a little higher than was actually reported. Next up is my battle royale of choice, Apex Legends, which managed an average FPS of 131 and oh so solid lows. As for Fortnite, the game ran fairly well overall at an average of 168 FPS, but weirdly our 1% and 0.1% lows were a little looser here than I would have liked to see. And then wrapping things up is PUBG, with an average FPS of 165 with, unlike Fortnite, much more stable lows. Overall, this is one hell of an impressive showing for the 10700KF, even though it was definitely held back by my GTX 1080. These higher than expected results were almost directly thanks to the really impressive clock speeds that this chip was able to hit. It had no trouble hitting its single and all core max turbo speeds of 4.7 and 5.1 gigahertz respectively, although in doing so, it did have to go beyond its rate of TDP, maxing out at 145 watts. It also did so at very manageable temperatures, with the chip idling around 33 degrees Celsius, with that ramping up to about 68 degrees while under full load. I didn't mess around too much with overclocking after these benchmarks, basically because I want to save that for an upcoming video, hopefully. But I just couldn't help myself. And I'm glad I didn't, because this thing has some mammoth OC potential. With literally less than 2 minutes of tinkering, I was easily able to push the chip's single core frequency up from 5.1 GHz to 5.4 GHz, and its all core frequency from 4.7 GHz to 5 GHz. I'm not sure whether this is exclusively due to the chip being a great overclocker, or Asus's tough gaming Z490 just being awesome, but I'm guessing it's a bit of both. Anyway, I fired up Cinebench one more time, and holy frappuccino! Multi-core score went from 4664 to 5081, and single jumped from 490 all the way up to 546. That's crazy town right there. It wasn't free performance though, as this OC did push the chip's TDP to 183 watts, and our temps to 78 degrees. But it was completely stable, and there's clearly even more headroom for higher overclocks. Now, as we're nearing the end of this video, let's get down to business. Intel has been squeezing every last drop of performance they can out of the Skylake architecture. And they've done that for many years now. And with this release, I feel like this is just the last drop it had left. I mean, surely, it has to be. And these 10th gen chips are a direct result of that. Stable, crazy high clock speed monsters that ensure that Intel keeps the best gaming CPU title just a little longer. Which is probably the last consumer-oriented crown that AMD hasn't stolen from them yet. But here's the thing. 
or multiple things. While these are some crazy fast chips, they don't have much else going for them. AMD's Ryzen lineup remains the best value option at pretty much every point. The simple fact is that if you're looking at one of these CPUs, AMD has a cheaper option that performs almost as well and sometimes even comes with more cores and threads and most of them even include coolers in the box. How crazy is that Intel? That's, that's crazy town right there. And that's before we even take Z490 into consideration. By locking these chips down to only working with Z490 boards, Intel is forcing the added cost of the motherboard onto the chip itself, which just ends up making Ryzen's options look that much more appealing. And while we're on the topic of Z490, the new socket, and the fact that some Z490 boards actually feature support for PCIe Gen 4, even though these new 10th gen Intel chips don't feature support for PCIe Gen 4, seems to point to this generation of CPUs as being kind of like placeholder CPUs. Placeholders for Intel's much more modern, technologically advanced Ice Lake generation of CPUs, which might make anyone who actually buys this generation regret holding out just a little longer for the next generation. And on top of all of that, let's not forget that we still have some new Ryzen chips due to launch sometime later this year. Chips that will almost definitely narrow the clock speed gap that exists between Intel and AMD even more. But all of that being said, it would be a disservice to downplay what Intel has done here. These new chips offers consumers more cores, more threads, better clock speeds, and at a lower price than what they had on the previous generation. And the Z490 platform is actually pretty impressive. And assuming they'll support the upcoming generation of CPUs, they're actually pretty promising as well. So look, these are great chips. Amazing chips even, especially if you're a gamer who wants the absolute best gaming performance you can get for your dollar right now. But if gaming isn't what you're going to be using your system for most of the time, or you're looking for the best performance per dollar, then you already know where to look. And speaking of looking, you need to look down below this video and hit the like button, get subscribed, and while you're down there, go ahead and check out my Patreon. It's the best way to support the channel and the work I do here directly, and comes with some pretty sweet benefits. And lastly, thanks to Asus South Africa for sending the board along with the chip over for me to review. This video literally wouldn't have been possible without them. Anyway, that's me done. I hope you're all staying safe out there and I'll see y'all in the next video. Cheers.